Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Marty Blumberg was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. His recently released book, My Brooklyn, My Way, From Brownsville to Canarsie in the 1950s, chronicles his childhood through a series of short stories and poems. In this episode, Marty will share some of his most cherished recollections about his early years, including stories about his family, friends, neighbors, local shops, vacations in the Catskills, and summertime fun. Marty is a master storyteller who will transport you to a simpler time and place where people made the most of what little they had and found joy in relationships with each other. I'd like to now welcome Marty to our show. Welcome, Marty. Hi, James. Happy to be here. Well, it is great to have you. Marty, I'm going to start off by asking you this question. What inspired you to write your book, My Brooklyn, My Way? Well, James, a few years ago, uh, I started to go onto social media. And what I did was I would write different stories and I would have different poems and tell about my memories of growing up in Brooklyn. I could not believe the amount of people that were able to relate to my stories. And it became so exciting that they would ask me to keep on writing and writing and writing. And uh, it came to a point where they even asked me if I could write a book. And that's what really started me to get involved in writing a book about my years growing up in Brooklyn during the 40s and 50s. Wow, that's great. Because this podcast, one of our main goals is to get people to tell stories. And you certainly have some wonderful stories to share. And a lot of people have these stories tucked away in their memories but don't write them down. And sometimes they don't even tell them to people. Wouldn't you agree? I agree 100%. And I think the main reason is that I lived in an era in the 40s and 50s that I loved so much. I just wanted my grandchildren and kids all around the world to see how it was like to experience living in a whole different area and a whole different upbringing that they are used to today. Yeah. You know, Often when we think of history, we think about dates and political situations and wars and things like that. But I think we have to remember that all of us have a history and there's a personal history that we have. Every one of us has something individual that's very important to us. And a lot of people can learn and have a lot of enjoyment by hearing these stories. Yeah. And, uh, when COVID-19 hit in uh, January 2020, I thought that would be a good time to take all my social media writings and all my poems and put it into one uh, book. And that's the reason why it came out during that time. So people that were home and they, they were getting bored, it brought back great memories to them and they really enjoyed reminiscing about the past. And a lot of things I wrote about seem to uh, resonate with them. And they were able to adhere to the same stories that I went through as a young child growing up in Brooklyn. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, you hear about a lot of bad things that have happened during this COVID situation. You know, a lot of people have lost people, people have lost jobs. It's been kind of tough, but it seems to me like you were able to bring something very positive and good out of really being quarantined, wouldn't you say? I would say so, yes. And uh, many of the memories that I have of uh, being a child, I even today, I think of new ones. And uh, hopefully, I'm going to put it into a new book eventually, because uh, there's so many great stories that I had growing up in uh, Brooklyn during those times. Okay, well, let's start talking about some of those stories. I'd like to start by asking you, where were you born, Marty? And where did you grow up? Well, I was born a uh, very different type of story. I was born on Hopkinson Avenue in Brooklyn. My mother was the type of person that kept a lot of secrets. And uh, believe it or not, no one really knew she was pregnant until she burst the water 
and my father had to take it to Kings County Hospital, uh, they found out that she was pregnant. And I was born, I was born in Bethel, by the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, they weren't prepared because when I got back to my house on Hopkinson Avenue, the apartment we lived in, it only had two bedrooms, very tiny, very small, and we had no crib. And my father was saying, gee, there isn't a room in this apartment for a crib that's so small. So he came up with the idea to put me into a drawer. And for the first eight months of living in Hopkinson Avenue, I slept in the sock drawer for the first two months. As I grew, I went to the middle drawer. By the time the eight months was up, I was in the big sweater drawer at the bottom. And I think my parents realized it's time to move to a different uh, location. (laughs) You're out of drawers at that point. And uh, I I couldn't fit. So we we, we managed to move about four or five blocks away to Amboy Street. Okay. Uh, which was a little bigger, not that much bigger, but there was a place in the kitchen for a crib. And that's where I stayed till I was about two years old. I slept in the kitchen in the crib. Okay. So they improvised. They improvised. The funny thing is, and this is a, all my stories are true. My father was a mailman and he had to get up very early in the morning. For some reason, he turned out to have his own room. He had his own bedroom. And we only had one other bedroom. So here we are, five boys. I was uh, next to the youngest and my mother, all sleeping in one bedroom. It just so happens we had a couch, a sofa couch in the living room that opened up into a bed. And my two older brothers would sleep in the one extra bedroom. And myself, my two brothers and my mother would sleep on the studio couch. It was crazy. Sometimes I'd wake up, my uh, younger brother's foot would be in my face. (laughs) But this is how we are. And that's why people say, gee, they they had to be a close family living like that. (laughs) I hope he washed his feet. (laughs) That I couldn't tell you. (laughs) Marty, I'd like to back up a little bit and ask you, what do you know about your family's roots? Where did they come from originally? They managed to come from Eastern Europe, which was Austria. And they came over by boat and uh, they landed in Ellis Island and they settled on the Lower East Side in New York City. Do you know approximately when they came over? Uh, Yes. It was sort of the late 19th century when they came into this uh, country. Was that both sides of your family? Uh, Yes, both sides. They managed to find one another here. They weren't married in... uh, Austria. They were married in New York. And uh, my parents were born in 1909, same um, year. And they were born on the Lower East Side in uh, New York City. They did get married. And in 1929, my oldest brother was born. And after that, about four years apart, each of my brothers were born. So we were all five boys. We're all very close. And we're all about four years apart. One funny story is I was born September 12th, 1941. My older brother, Herb, was born September 12th, 1931. Exactly 10 years to the day. And the story goes, there's always a story, we're always talking as family and getting together, is that we are too poor to get a toy for for my brother when he was 10 years old. So they decided it would be cheaper to have me as a uh, brother. For the last... 60, 70 years, we celebrate every birthday together, and we go out with them, uh, their family, and we really enjoy being together. You started telling us about your mom. She liked to keep secrets, and uh, she was very good, apparently, at keeping secrets. What can you tell me about your mom? What was she like? What kind of stories do you remember about her? Well, as long as I remember, my mom was always a sick person. She had a bad heart. She had a rheumatic heart. She was on this medication, Digitalis, as long as I know her. It was very hard for her to breathe. When she'd walk up one or two steps, she always had to st- uh, stop and take a breath. That's the reason why we always lived on the first floor, because we knew there was no elevator, so she was never able to climb any steps. But she would st- sit by the window most of the day, and her conversation was with neighbors passing by. Everyone knew her. She was very friendly. And one funny story is that we had a neighbor 
in the back of, uh, on the first floor. She lived in the back, we lived in the front. Her name was Frances. And Frances happened to weigh about 300 pounds. She was very, very heavy. And she was going through a divorce, which was very unusual during those times. Mm -hmm. And my mom was a listener and she would give some uh, ideas on how to settle certain problems. And she was the one Frances would come to, to tell all her sorrows and all her problems. I remember as a child, I had to be about four or five years old. Frances came to the kitchen. My mom would make a coffee. They would sit around the kitchen table and we had a cookie jar on the table. And Frances would open up the cookie jar, take the cookies, dip it in the coffee and talk. And for some reason, nature called. She had to go to the bathroom. And I don't think she ever went into my bathroom, but she, she took a mere dish to get to the bathroom. Little did she know the bathroom had no wash sink. The bathroom was so small that only one person could pass at one time. She got stuck between the bathtub and the wall. Oh, no. Literally stuck. She couldn't move. And she started to scream to my mother. My mother called the fire department. And the fire department came to our house to let her free. Uh, I don't want to tell you about the mess she made, but she never made it to the toilet. I had an idea. It wasn't going to turn out too well. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Was your mother a good listener? She was a very good listener. And since she couldn't travel and she was sick, always uh, we had a certain pillow for her. And the pillow we called the rock. Uh, it was a type of pillow that was four pillows built into one with all the feathers. And because she had to sit upright when she slept to breathe better, uh, she would sleep on a rock. She would take the rock in the morning when she woke up and put it on the windowsill. And she would lean on the rock and she would talk to all the neighbors going by. And she was always inviting them, always talking to them. And this is for so her social life. Since she couldn't run out that often, that's what she did. Now, in your book, you talked about your mom and cooking. Can you tell us about your mom's cooking and how was it? Uh, she was a, on certain things, she was an excellent cook. The thing that I remember is her pea soup. She made a, a pea soup that the aroma went through the whole house and I knew she was making pea soup, which was my favorite. Uh, she would take frankfurters and cut frankfurters up and put it in the pea soup and it was thick. To be honest, uh, James, I've went to so many restaurants trying to duplicate that pea soup. I never could because it was the best I ever tasted. Oh, wow. I can, I, you know, when you were talking about some of the dishes that your mom made that were specialties of hers, I could almost taste the food the way you were describing it. Yes. Yes. She was, she did have a unique way of, uh, she spent a lot of time in the kitchen. She also spent a lot of time doing a lot of chores in the house. Like, you know, during those days, you're talking about the forties and fifties, we had no uh, washing machines. There was no dryers. She would be on our hands and knees scrubbing on a washboard and uh, cleaning all our clothes. And there were five boys and we had a clothesline in the back alley of our house that connected to another neighbor. And we would dry all the clothes on the clothesline, hoping that there was no rain or anything like that. And we would always try to help my mom because we knew she was sick. During those times, she didn't have to tell us to do anything. We knew it was the right thing to do. One funny story was our neighbor on the other end of the uh, clothesline was cooking and she needed sugar. She would yell out the window, Frida, I need some sugar. And if the line was empty, my mom would take a clothespin, put some sugar in a bag, and with the pulley system, she would wheel the, uh, the sugar to my neighbor on the other side of the alley so she could have her sugar. And this is the way neighbors were. Everyone's trying to help one another, and were they able to put a look for us on the line? Uh, thank God there was no clothes on there because she would have had to take all the clothes off at this point. In there. Just out of curiosity, okay, you got clothes out there on the line drying. What happens when it gets cold? Uh, you will not believe it. When the clothes gets frozen, and in the wintertime, we did put it out too, you would be able to stand them all up like statues. To get them to thaw out, we had to put them on the radiator. There was a radiator in every room, and every room had clothes on there, and you would see water drip dripping down from all the clothes and ice to get it all thawed out. 
but everybody was in the same boat, right, Marty? Yeah, all the neighbors were in the same boat. Money was not a, a initial. No one ever talked about money. Everyone just talked about friends and being helpful. If you look down our street, when we walk down our street, you would see neighbors, not only my mom looking out the window, the other neighbors looking out the window. And sometimes they would talk to one another from one window to the other, because this was the relationship they had with one another. Everybody sort of knew each other, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone was friendly. Now, what about refrigeration? What did you have to keep your food cold? Did you have a refrigerator? Well, well I was born in 1941. And I do recall we had an icebox. The icebox was pre-refrigerator. What it was was a, a large uh, container up on top where an iceman would have a job. He would come around with ice, lug it on his back, bring it into your apartment, clean it out a little bit, and put the chunk of ice in the uh, freezer. And that's what kept all the food cold. He'd come back about two days later when the ice melted and put another block of ice in. And this is uh, a standard thing that happened every, every day. Wow. What about heating your apartment? How was your apartment heated? This was, uh, I, I can't believe how, you know, during those times we had coal, coal heating. And if you would uh, visualize how it was, a truck would pull up in front of a uh, house. It was a six family house. We two families on each floor, three floors up. And we were right in the front, right where the cellar was, the basement. And a truck would pull up and have like a sliding pond, like a chute that came into the basement. They would open a lid up and all black coal would sit, would come sliding down. My mom would walk away from the window because she would never be able to breathe that. But it happened to go into our apartment and uh, it was very unhealthy. And most of the homes were heated with coal. Yeah, I would imagine you had to be very careful about your mom's health. Yes. Wow. But you didn't have much choice as far as heating the home. No, in fact, my mom, which I mentioned, had a very bad heart, heart condition. She lived to 62. But the doctors gave up with her when she was 40 years old. She had about four or five major heart attacks. I remember as a kid... Uh, the ambulance coming, usually they came from Kings County. That was the big hospital of that time. And they went into the room where she was lay, lying and they would put them on a stretcher. And as a boy, five, six years old, I would stand by the door, always wondering whether she would live or die, always wondering whether she, she would come back. But she was a fighter and she always came back. And uh, we had a very, very uh, good relationship. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, I want to talk to you about your dad. Now, you mentioned he was a mailman. What else can you tell me about your dad, your memories of him? And your uh, days? A very frugal person, lived to 82 years old, very sharp. I remember when an A&P opened up, he would try to get the advantage of everyone. So he was into King Corn stamps and s &H green stamps. This ad said that if you go into a &P on the grand opening day, one to a person, they would give a free 100 uh, S&H green stamps, free. So one day he packed us up into the car, all five boys, and we had to take different jackets too. He said, here, here's 20 cents, go and buy uh, an apple. Here's uh, 15 cents, go and buy 20 grapes. And what we would do is every time we made a purchase, we would get the 100 uh, uh, s &H green stamps. He was in the car, putting them, pasting them in the book. And he put say, hey, put this jacket on now and do the same thing. Here's, here's another five cents by a, a pair. And by the time you turned around, we probably made about 20 trips. We were able to get a free tape recorder with all the s and green stamps. He, that's the type of guy he was. He was excellent in myth. I remember going to a store with him and uh, it was a supermarket. I was a little older. And as he was throwing things in the basket, his head was figuring out how much each item was. And he says, this bill is going to be $17.20. The register girl at the end rings it all up and it came out to be $16.44. He said, you made a mistake. She says, no, I didn't. I wrong everything up. He made her take everything, ring it up again, and you want to know something? He was acting to the penny. 
<laughs> Nobody was going to get a, one over on him, right? No, no, no. He had it all figured out in his head. Marty, didn't he also have a little side hustle going on with it, with vending machines or something like that? Yeah, you know, he's always trying to be an entrepreneur. He always wanted to be uh, a little different, make extra money. In fact, before I get into that, he was a mailman in Manhattan Beach, which was a very exclusive area, very rich area. There were judges, doctors, uh, one family homes. And he had a nickname and his nickname was Kelly. And I said, well, Kelly, your name is Irving. Why would it be Kelly? He said to me, the reason why he says when Christmas time comes, I do much better. Instead of getting $2, I'll get $3 because these rich people give me more money thinking I was Irish and my name was Kelly. <laughs> but he was always trying to pull things out. In our apartment, he had dog food. We didn't have a dog. We didn't have any animals. He had a dog food. He said, Dad, why would you have dog food in the house? I was hungry one time. I was looking for something to eat. All there was in the cabinet was dog food. He said the reason why, when he delivered the mail in the morning, there were very a lot of stray dogs running around. And if he got a little nervous or something, he would take the dog food out of his mail bag and, and feed them uh, dogs uh, dog food. So he was always one step ahead. He never really missed a day of work. What he used to do... And I'll get into this later. We were the first to have just about everything, even though we didn't have enough money. But he had a secure job. He worked for the government. He was never unemployed. But when, when he heard the forecast was going to be snow, he would take his car, park it about five, six blocks away under the L, the elevator where the train went. And the reason why he did that is that he was able to get into work. He didn't have to worry about shoveling snow, cleaning the car up. And he was always... No matter what time he had to get up, he got up and he made that mail come to each of his uh, customers. He was always thinking ahead, wasn't he? Always, always. He saved stamps. He had a lot of hobbies. And he was always looking to uh, give you We had 25 bank accounts. You would think we were rich. We weren't rich. We were poor. But each account had an average of $3 in each account. I said, Dad, why do you have so many banks? He says, well... The bank's opening up down the block. They're giving away free gifts. So I'm going to open up an account. So, <laughs> so we had plenty of free gifts in the house. Oh, you have like clock radios and <laughs> things like that. Yes. Yeah. They things like them. that. Yeah. You can't have enough clock radios, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think they had clock radios then probably. Uh, but, probably not. No. So, so tell me about this vending machine business he had. The vending machine business was a, uh, he had it for about two years and it was a successful business, but he used to keep all the cashew nuts, all the pistachio nuts, all the charms, everything in his room. It came to a point like he was like a hoarder. You couldn't get into the room. There was so much stuff there. So my mom finally said, get rid of it. And she, she made sure that he got rid of all the vending machines. And I used to help them go around to the different places, weigh the money. We had a scale and we were in uh, bars, we were in stores. He had, a, he had a few things, but he's always looking to make an extra dollar. Even though he had to get up very early for work, he had to get up like 4, 430 to get into the post office sometime. But. but he had something going on all the time. So you said he was always, you know, getting the first of everything. What about television sets? Did he have a television set? Yeah, since he was always looking to get be the first on everything. We were the first to have a telephone, first to have a television set, first to have a car. If you could visualize how our TV was, this is how it was. It was a view tone. It was a seven-inch TV. He came home from work one day with the TV, and it was in the late 40s. No one ever saw a TV, even heard about it. We had three stations, and each station had a pattern that you would sit in front of the set and wait for a show to go on. My brothers, we would watch Cowboys. My mother would watch Ed Sullivan show, uh, Milton Berle, uh, Toast of the Town, Steve Allen show. But there was always interference on the set. It never came over good. And he used to go on the roof. We had a roof antenna. And to get the uh, horizontal to hold and to get the uh, reception to be clear, he would go up on the roof. I had one brother at the set, one brother in the middle, one brother by the window. And they would say, better, better, better. And we'd yell up better to my father. 
worse, worse, worse. And he kept on moving the antenna. Finally, we said, perfect, perfect. And he comes down. By the time he came down, the wind blew and the TV was back to. <laughs> so, so this is what we had to go through. Uh, he was very innovative. Uh, he found that he could buy a magnifying glass that went onto our TV. Instead of a seven inch TV, it became bigger, maybe 12, 13 inches. So we had a bigger screen now. First in the area, no one even heard of it. Then he heard about color. And he came home with a tinted uh, shield that went in front of the magnifying glass. And he thought he had a color TV, but everything was tinted like in pinkish color. But <laughs> we had to have uh, the only set on the block. And people, they knew that there was a, uh, a great show on or something like that. They would come to our house with chairs, sit it in our living room, and they would all be watching TV because no one ever knew. One time... Jersey Joe Walker was fighting Joe Lewis and people were lined up in front of my, we couldn't get them in. So my father took the TV, wheeled it, pushed it right in front of the front window where my mom sat and people would put the chairs on the gutter on the sidewalk and they would be sitting down watching the match, yelling, screaming, and they were able to watch the match through, through that uh, seven inch TV that would, turned out to be a color TV with a magnifying glass. Wow. You know, when you said seven inch screen and yeah. you think of the, some of the people I know who have whatever they are, like 84 inch screens or exactly. 90 inch screens, seven inch screen. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that, well, TV really started in the uh, late forties into the fifties. And uh, after a while, everyone had a TV who is also the first to have a, a telephone. Uh, we had a telephone. In those times, the telephone had party lines. And it uh, hung up uh, in the kitchen. If you wanted to make a call, you would pick up the phone and you would hear people talking because everyone shared. They had about three, four families sharing that same party line. And you couldn't call anyone unless they were off the phone. So sometimes we were on the phone. I would hear someone breathing very hard. Wait, and some would say, get off the phone already. You're on so long. And there was operators that would get uh, people to, uh, you had to call, you had to use operators. If you needed a dial tone, sometimes it took 5, 10, 15 minutes just to get a dial tone. We were the first in the area to have a telephone. Most of the people in our area, what they would do, they would give their phone number to the local candy store who had a booth with a telephone in it. And I remember uh, being with my friends, we were seven, eight years old. We would sit outside the candy store. And if we heard the phone ring, we would take turns. We would say, who's this? Oh, I want Mrs. Pomerantz. Uh, could you do me a favor? She lives on the fourth floor on 236 Amboy Street. Could you do me a favor? I want to talk to her. And one of the kids would run, and we took turns. We would run up the steps. The doorbells never uh, worked at all. And say, Mrs. Pomerantz, you got a phone call. She would give us three cents, four cents, a nickel. And that's how we made money to buy a Spalding ball or some bubble gum, bazooka gum, or some wax little bottles where we were able to drink some syrup out of. There were so many different things to do. And wow. uh, that was with the phone. So, and we were also the first to have a car. And what we did with the car, when my father had a vacation, which was like a one week out of the year, we would go up to the Catskill Mountains. And that was like a, a story in itself. Car always, when we got in, it wouldn't start up. My father had boosted the cables in the trunk. We, we had five boys in there, all raring to go to go to the Casco Mountains, to the hotels. We would travel on Route 17, and our first stop was always the Red Apple Rest. And the Red Apple Rest was a place where people had a little lunch. And my father would see a bus, like a Greyhound bus, driving there on Route 17. And he started to speed up. I said, Dad, why are you speeding up so much? He says, could you imagine when we get to the Red Apple Rest, that bus in front of us, there's going to be a line a mile long to go to the bathroom. So he would speed past the bus. When we got to Red Apple Rest, there were three buses parked right in front. <laughs> he, he didn't realize that they were constantly coming with buses. So, so that was the uh, thing there. But, the, but we used to go to the bungalow colonies. We used to go to Cook Lanes, they call it. We used to see all the... Uh, the top performers at the hotels, Jerry Lewis, Buddy Hackett, all the best comedians. 
And my father would always have a way of going to the manager of the hotel saying, look, we're not staying here at the Browns this time, but we plan on coming back next year. Could we stay around the facilities and use the pool? Oh, sure. If you're coming back. And we used to stay in the big hotels, never paid a penny, and go back to the bungalow and sleep in the little bed. And that was that we did. So, so it worked out fine. <laughs> oh, man. Your, your father really knew how to uh, be frugal. Yeah, his, and uh, his money's worth. That's for sure, Gene. Get the best out of the situation. So I would imagine... If I know anything about those old cars, you probably had the obligatory flat tire on the way up. Going up, always you would see cars overheated, smoke coming out of the cars. People used to keep uh, water bottles in their trunk. So in case it overheated, they had water to fill up the radiator. Cars were always breaking down. People would stop, give booster uh, to another car so it could start up. And instead of a two-hour trip or an hour and a half trip, it was more like a four or five-hour trip to get to the Casco Mountains. Oh, my goodness. But when you got there, you had a good time. Oh, yeah. We had a good time. But I was always happy to come back to Brooklyn. You know, we went berry uh, picking. We saw frogs, tadpoles. It was country. First time I ever saw a live cow. I didn't know from that. But coming back to Brooklyn and to Brownsville, where I was from originally on Amboy Street, there was nothing like seeing my friends and playing with them out, outside in the street. Well, that's a good segue because I'd like to ask you about what it was like as a kid back in the late 40s and the, say, early to mid 50s or even late 50s in the streets of Brownsville. What did you do? How did you make your own fun? Well, let me just give you an idea of how things were. When I walked out of my house, my apartment, my flat, whatever it may be, you would walk down the stoop. And when you would look around, you would see kids every age playing with one another. The thing was, a 10-year-old would not play with an 11-year-old. A 9-year-old would not play with... It was that age. It was so many kids. And you would look out and you see a group of kids playing hide and seek. You see a group of kids playing jump rope. You would see some girls playing, hey, my name is Alice with a ball. Kids would play stickball, off the wall, stoop ball. There was a ball called the Spalding. In other areas, they called what there's the Penzi or the Pensky or the Pinky. There was other names for that. But the Spalding, if you could imagine how it looked, it was a tennis ball without the fuzz. That's what it was. And it was able, you were able to put your finger in it and curve it. You could throw it, it would curve. It was a high bouncer. And that ball, that's all you needed in Brooklyn. That ball had so many uses, so many games, so many things. We used to play stickball. And I don't know whether they even play stickball nowadays. They, maybe the older men do because they remember their childhood. But young kids don't know from stickball. What we would do is go on the gutter which is where the cars were parked. There weren't too many cars then, so you didn't have to worry about, you know, cars coming down the street. We put ash cans, garbage cans that they used for the coal. We would put that at the end of the street so cars would not be able to come in. We would use a tire from a car that was flat as first base. Second base was a manhole. Third base was a, uh, a piece of cardboard. And we would play stickball day and night. And the unit of measure for stickball was how many sewers you could hit. <laughs> so it was probably about 60 feet apart from one another, all down the street. And you would use the spalding. You would hit the ball, run to bases, throwing out. We kept, uh, with chalk, we would write the score on the, uh, on the gutter. And it was so exciting. People would be looking out their windows and people would be cheering. It was uh, Unbelievable. But the Spalding, always things happen to that Spalding. A lot of times it went on the roof. So we, we had to continue the game. We didn't want to go on the roof at that time. Many times it rolled down the sewer. Oh, no. And the sewer was where all the drain water would go. And there was always a, uh, a kid on a block, the smallest kid usually. And we called him the sewer rat. <laughs> and sometimes what we would do, believe it or not, we'd hold him by his feet he would put his head down, head first in the sewer, retrieve the ball, and we could play our game. And when he came up, everyone would clap. And they would say, gee, I can't believe it, we got the ball. And sometimes we would just use a, a 
a stick with a little hook at the end to get the ball up because we, we didn't go into stores to buy bats. What we did, we took our mom's broomstick or a mop. We would cut the handle and we would use that, tape it up and use that as the bat. So if you had a Spalding and a broomstick, you could play night and day. What other games did you play? Well, we played uh, Ring Alivio. That was a popular game. I played a game called Pax. And a pack is a hail from a shoe. And we'd go into the shoemaker and each kid would be walking around with three or four packs in his pocket. One was called a slider. One was called a sticker. One was very high. One was very low. And the idea was to throw the pack to the third line, the crack in the sidewalk. You would knock them off by sliding one of the uh, packs. You would use different packs to play. We played tops. Tops was like a thing with, on a string and a wooden thing. And you would throw it down and it would do a rotation and spin. And you would try to hit the other person's top. And if you hit it right spot, it would just split in half. And that was a great thing if you were able to do that. We played uh, stoop wall, off the wall, kick ball, kick the can. It was just imagination. Kids just thought of their own games. And everyone stayed in their group. Everyone played. One advantage was since we were the Blumberg boys, and there were five boys about four years apart, if anyone needed anyone else to play, they would always knock at our door, and there was always a boy their age to play with. And this is how life was in Brooklyn. Wow. So... It didn't really cost much money to get an old broomstick or a Spalding. No, no, no. In fact, uh, if a stick broke, a kid would run into his house and without his mother seeing, he would take another uh, broom and use that as a uh, bat. You know, it's funny, but nothing against organized sports. But nowadays, it seems that the kids are mostly involved in leagues, organized leagues and things like that. I remember just recently saying to my wife, we drove by a couple ball fields on a beautiful day. I think it was back in the fall. And I, there wasn't one kid out on the field. There, there was nobody out on the streets or out on the fields. And I was like, wow, where is everybody? And I think about what you're telling me. It sounds like the streets were pretty much full of kids out there playing. The streets were our ballpark. That's what it was. We had an advantage, too. When we lived on Amboy Street, we lived uh, two blocks from Betsy Head Pool. Betsy Head Pool was a, uh, a state-run park. It was tremendous. It had to be about uh, three, four blocks long, and it was 10 cents to get in after 10 o'clock. And my father would always tell me, don't go 10 o'clock. Go 5 to 10. It's free. It's free shift. So I used to go right before, you know, the 10 cents changed, and I would be swimming the whole day. We never went away for the uh, summer to summer camp like kids nowadays. I went to the pool and I remember my mom sitting out the window and she saw one of my friends walking by. She says, Joey, do me a favor. Take this bag, throw it over the, over the fence to my, my son, Marty. He's in the, at the pool. And all of a sudden I hear Joey yelling, Marty, Marty, I would come out of the water. What? I got your lunch. Oh, throw it over the fence. And as he threw the lunch over the fence, it went into the water and he had a good arm because it went into the pool, into the chlorine water. <laughs> I, ate, I ate the sandwich, the chlorine, it was moist, but it tasted good, the sandwich. <laughs> I, was very, I, I was very easy to please. So he threw the lunch over the wall and it went into the pool. Exactly. <laughs> That's what it was. I never complained. That's the kind of all the sons were that way. We knew it was fine. She made one lunch. We didn't want her to bother making another lunch. And that's, that's the way we were. Now, Marty, what was it like when it would get really hot in the city during the summer? What were those nights like? Well, we utilized a lot. Uh, the people that lived above us, they had fire escapes. On the first floor, there was no fire escape. And people used to sleep out on the fire escape. We went to Tar Beach. Tar Beach was on the roof. That's what we call <laughs> Tar Beach. And we would take a blanket and what we would do is... Uh, sleep even on the roof. I remember my mother was having a problem breathing and there was no air conditioning. So, but we did have a fan, a rotating fan. We would go to the ice box, chop off a piece of ice, put it on in, into a napkin and hold it in front of the fan. So when it blew, she would have like cold air. That's what we called the air conditioning during those times. 
the ice would melt and the, the cold breeze would blow in her face. I'm picturing you in this baking hot apartment with your brother's feet in your face. Uh, <laughs> but you want to know something? We all got along with one another. We very rarely played outside with one another because we were different age groups. One story I have to tell you is one of my brothers was into baseball cards, which was something where kids would come out with shoe boxes and have loads of baseball cards. They would flip them. They would throw them against the wall. It was something that they just enjoy doing. And how we got the baseball cards, we would buy tops. They would give you a piece of gum in there, a flat piece of gum, and you would get two or three cards in there. And my brother Jack would sit on the linoleum floor on a rainy day, and he would have a baseball game. And he would use these cards by putting them in each of their positions. And it was like he would announce the game. He would keep score. And it came down to the World Series where the Brooklyn Dodgers were playing the Yankees. And he had a Mickey Mantle card. And Mickey Mantle was up. I walked in the kitchen. First, I thought he was nuts. But I started to cheer. I wasn't cheering for Mickey Mantle, but I was cheering for the Brooklyn Dodgers. We were all Brooklyn Dodger fans. But Mickey Mantle, he would take a, uh, a cigarette wrapper, the cellophane and the silver, and make it into a ball, throw it up in the air, and take a swing with the card. At one time I was standing, Mickey Mantle was up. The card hit the ball perfectly. It went over my head, over the uh, stove, into the kitchen sink. It landed right in the sink for a home run. Later on, we found out that card was Mickey Mantle's 1953 rookie card. Oh, no. We would have been on easy street, but we still had to stay on ambush because the card was all ripped and he threw it in the garbage. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> but you're left with a beautiful memory of it. Oh, yes, yes. I still talk to him nowadays. I said, why do you hit? I wish Mickey Mantle would have struck out. If he would have done, that car would have been in mint condition. We would have been $5 million. It just went for about two months ago, that card. You could go to the Catskills every summer. And my father would pay for the Concord. No, <laughs> you have to tell him he's coming back. Yeah. So you mentioned the Brooklyn Dodgers. Did you and or your brothers get to any games? Uh, yes, uh, LC wrappers, LC ice cream was a big thing during those times. And if you bought an ice cream pop, you would hold the wrapper. If you got 10 wrappers, you were able to go to Ebbets Fields free, sit in the bleachers, and watch the Brooklyn Dodgers. We used to love Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, uh, Carl Ferrillo, Duke Snyder, Pee Wee Reese. They had the greatest ball players of it. In 1955, they won the uh, series. They won it from the Yankees. I was 14 years old. You would not believe the people having parties and yelling out the window, coming out with pots and pans, hitting the pots and pans. It was like we won another war. That's the way it was. And uh, that was the first time the, uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers ever won. And a few years later, they moved away from us. And most of the Brooklyn fans did not become Dodger fans anymore. They lost all their interest for baseball. Because walking around the streets, you asked me how it was walking around. At night, people would be sitting on their stoops. Everyone had a radio. Everyone would be listening to the Brooklyn Dodgers. I remember walking with my friends, and we would stop at every stoop to say, what score is it? What happened? Jackie Robinson got a hit, this and that. Unbelievable team. Uh, especially when they won at 55. An unbelievable day. My father was a Brooklyn Dodger fan and he lived in <clears throat> Essex County, New Jersey, but he was, oh, always, he was always a Brooklyn Dodger fan and he lost interest in baseball after the Dodgers moved out to California. Yeah. You know, being a kid, we used to go to the uh, corner candy store. There was always one Yankee fan or one giant fan and the loads of Brooklyn fans. And there was always debates going on. Who's better? Duke Snyder or Mickey Mantle or Yogi Berra or Roy Campanella. There was always arguments going on, always debates going on. And this was at night. We had no curfew. It was crazy. Sometimes we would play stickball or a game till the lights came on in the streets and it was dark. And my mom would always call me and say, it's dinner time. And one thing we did, all the kids would stop when it was dinner time. And we all sat around the table with our family, without cell phones. <laughs> and, <laughs> And we spoke about current events and things that are happening around. And uh, it got the family really close. And we got to appreciate 
each other's interests much more because it was talked about a lot. Oh, that's wonderful. In your book, I think you mentioned about extended family coming over to the house and visiting. What was that like? Yeah, that was, again, my mom was ill. She didn't travel a lot, but our house was the meeting place of all my relatives. And they would come usually on a Sunday. One car pulled out, one car pulled in. And my mom would always feed them, always give them things. The women would drink a cherry herring, I remember. It was like a cherry drink. The men would have Hagen Haig pinch, Shivas Regal. And what they would do is have like a shot glass where they would have water. And I don't know why they did it, but they would drink water right after each drink. And they would talk and talk about politics. And, and then the other group would come. And there was no room in the apartment. They had to leave. So it was always people coming in and out of my apartment on Amboy Street and got the family to be very close. Oh, I bet it did. Now, I hear a lot about Coney Island. People back in that era used to go to Coney Island quite a bit. What yes. do you remember about Coney Island? Well, my father always wanted to, since he had a car, to go different places. We did go to Coney Island. We did go to Nathan's. We went to Lundy's in Sheepshead Bay. They had the best seafood. They had a short dinner for like $6. They would put biscuits on the table before you walked in. I remember my father putting biscuits in my mom's pocketbook so we could have them when we got home the next day. Of course. Uh, and it was crazy at Lundy's because it served 5,000 dinners a day. And it was so big. And would you believe there was no maitre d'? There was no maitre d' seating the people. And we would line up on Emmons Avenue and... When it got to you at the front, you would look around and see people finishing on, des on dessert. You'd walk over to the table, stand behind them, waiting them to finish. And as soon as they took that last bite, you would dash in the seat so you would get that table. So Lundy's was a great thing. In Coney Island, we had the best Nathan's, which is still there today. And I used to go a lot when I lived in Canarsie after I moved over from uh, Brownsville, we used to hitchhike to Coney Island. The reason why we hitchhiked, we lived near the Bell Parkway. And to get to Coney Island from the Bell Parkway is 15 minutes. To get there by train and bus, it's over an hour. So I remember going with my friends. We had to be about 16, 17 years old. We hitchhiked on the Bell Parkway and we got to Coney Island. And there was about four of us in the car. What we would do when we got to Coney Island, we'd go on the rides, we'd have a Frank and Nathan's, we would walk around, them, and this is what we did. And then we would play games. And there was one game, I recall, uh, being with my friends in Coney Island, where we had ping pong balls. And you had to throw the ping pong balls into a fish tank. There was goldfish in a little glass-like. Whatever we did, we were able to get that ball in, in, into the uh, fish tank. And what you would do, you would win that fish. So here we are, ready to go home with about 15 to 20 bowls of uh, goldfish <laughs> and try to hitchhike home with four guys. We would line up all the uh, bowls in the grass, put our finger out, the car would stop, and we'd take about 20 trips taking all the bottles into the uh, car. I don't want to tell you what happened. They hit a bump, two of the goldfish, I don't know where they are today, but they're somewhere in this guy's car. He still has it. <laughs> You didn't think about this before you won the fish, did you? No, we were very lucky. We had a very good day, and they, they kept on coming in. Ah, terrific. You mentioned about moving to Canarsie. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes. The uh, New York State was having a, a, not a raffle, but if you earned a certain amount of money, uh, you were able to apply to move into this project, which was called Bayview Project in Canarsie. We were able to get in. And we moved on the sixth floor. No more first floor. This was the sixth floor. And this was something that we couldn't believe it. New apartment, new appliances, a refrigerator, a gas range, a washer and dryer. My mother was so impressed. She just couldn't believe it that she was able to take her kids that had nothing at all and put them up to this level where they had all the luxuries of life. My mom would still look out the window, but instead of seeing people walk by because we're on the sixth floor, she was able to see Canarsie Pier, which was water. It was like a utopia for her. We just enjoyed Canarsie, and there was uh, a singing group. During that time, I was like 18 years old already when we finally moved there. 
and you would walk on the corners, there was doo groups and there would seem rock and roll. Right. And this was in the late 50s. And some of these groups that had one song wonders, we had a group called the Impalas that sang I Ran All the Way Home. And this fellow Speedo, Joe Frazier, his name was, was uh, a friend of mine. We would play ball together and they hit this song and it became number one. And it was, uh, everyone sang of walking through the streets and doo-wop groups. Later on, when I was married and my wife and I went to a concert, they were performing. We wanted to see him. And I went over to Joe. I said, Joe, you remember me? He says, you're Marty. I said, yes, we used to play basketball together and everything like that. And I walked away from my wife. I said, I don't know if he remembered, just wanted to be polite. But before his presentation, and before he sang, he got up in front of the audience and he says, I want to make this song to my friend Marty Blumberg from Canarsie, who I played basketball with. And that was like a real treat because here's a star that mentioned my name in front of uh, all these people. And it was a great experience. Oh, yeah, I bet it was. I mean, I've heard of the Impalas. Yeah, yeah. They made uh, one or two songs uh, and uh, it was a number one song. During that time, that was, was going on in Brooklyn. Every corner, there was doo-wop groups. Everyone was singing. We had a clubhouse. We would invite uh, sororities into our clubhouse. We would dance with the girls. When it came a certain time, we'd tell the girls to leave. We would sometimes even give them, we would play cards after they left. You would never uh, have a girl come on a Saturday. Always Friday nights, the girls would come. Saturday was date night. It was great being a teenager and uh, also being a young person living in Brooklyn. You know, there's a lot of charm in what you were saying. I'm, I'm just picturing these doo-wop groups singing and it being a simpler era, late 50s. It must have been an exciting time. And of course, it was good for you to know that your mom had it a little easier in her new place. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, we felt so great because she was able to really appreciate the luxuries that were around and we got off Amboy Street. I was very fortunate because Canarsie to Brownsville is probably about four miles. I was able to get my friends from uh, Brownsville to come out to Canarsie. And I had my friends, my new friends in Canarsie. And we all got together. And we, instead of having friends in different areas, we all combined and everyone became friends. And till today, we are still in contact with one another and we still see one another. I think that is absolutely wonderful to be able to have friendships for that many years. It must be just a real blessing. It is. And a lot of uh, memories that I have, they have those same memories and we're able to share them on a personal relationship, which is great. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, your brothers, are you all still close? Well, I did have four brothers. There were five boys. My oldest brother passed away last year. He was 90 years old. Oh, I'm sorry. And we were very close. All the brothers would go out for dinners. We'd go to a performance or something. We would do things a lot together. Today, we range in age from 75 to 89. My oldest brother, that's 89, was the one that's exactly 10 years older than me. We still see each other. We still communicate. We all live on Long Island. We all live within a uh, spalding throw away from one another if you have a good arm. And we enjoy talking about the old days. That's how using their conversation. And everyone has another story. So I did not only know my stories from the, my age, I knew my brother that was four years older than me, my brother that was 10 years older than me. I know all their stories. I know all their friends. I know all went on. So I have a lot of great memories of not only my experiences, but also their experiences. That's a treasure trove of stories. Yes, yes. Now, I want to ask you, you mentioned something about girls when you were in Canarsie. So did you happen to meet a special girl when you were there? Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> it, <laughs> was a, about her. it was a winter night, and we used to go to dances on Friday night. There was a dance in Regal Park, in one of the Jewish centers in Regal Park, and... Uh, I went with two of my friends and we drove to Beagle Park to Queens. They had a live band. That's what they had then. And it was very minor amount of money to get in, probably 25 cents. And 
I walked in and believe it or not, I saw this girl that was on the other end of the dance floor. And for some reason, I couldn't take my eyes off her. So I managed to uh, finally get enough strength to go over and ask her to dance. Thank God she said yes. And we danced a slow dance. And I started to ask her questions. I said, you have a brother? She said, yes. I said, you have no sister? She said, yes. I said, you just moved to Queens? She said, yes. I said, wait a second. You were going out with an Italian boy and you just broke up with him. And she says, yes. And the dance ended, I walked away. And the whole night long, she kept running after me. How'd you know that? How'd you know that? And I just played it like I didn't know anything at all. It was like four or five guesses that it was all correct. And she kept on running after me the whole night. Finally, we started to dance again. And I asked if I could take her home. And I remember taking her to Jan's ice cream parlor and buying like the kitchen sink. And we all of us put our spoons in and have a little ice cream. That's what it was. And I went to a door and I said, it was, we had a great time. Could I kiss you good night? And she put up her hand. She says, I don't kiss on the first date. I said, what happens if I tell you it's the last date? She let me give her a peck on the cheek and we kiss. <laughs> oh, you know what, Marty? You're very clever. There's a lot of your father in you, I think. <laughs> Not only that, the funny story was this. I got home. I said, Mom, I met a girl. My mother said, what kind of girl is she, she like? I said, Mom, she has a, uh, an elevated apartment. She has a doorman. As soon as I said that, my mom says, marry her. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. She met the first credential, right, that you needed? Yeah. Right away, she made her statement. We're married now. Maxine and I are married 57 years. We have three beautiful children, two girls and a boy, all professionals, 10 grandchildren. And like I was as a kid, being close, we're all very close. We all live in the New York area. Uh, Two of my kids live in the same town I do. We see each other very often, and we have a great relationship. And the the, the way I was brought up with my family, being around the dinner table, we're that way with our family, too. That's wonderful. So they're they're the beneficiaries of these wonderful stories as well. That is just great. Are you able to share some of these stories with your grandchildren? Yeah, I think that's one of the main reasons I really wrote this book, so my grandkids could appreciate how I lived. I remember uh, my wife and I used to babysit. I was the one that went into the bedroom to tell them a story. And I would ask them, I said, do you want to hear a fake belief story or you want to hear a true story when I was a kid? They would always pick a true story when I was a young kid. Everyone knows the stories. I was able to go over with them and they all reminisce and they all know people I used to hang out with, things I did as a kid. That is absolutely wonderful. Now, you were in the family business for a lot of years, weren't you, with uh, at least one of your brothers? Yes. Uh, my oldest brother, that's 10 years older than me, that's going to be 90, September 12th, goes into work even today, every day. He loves work. He enjoys it. Uh, I retired in uh, 2002, but he's still working. He's still going in. It's still a family business. It's called the Autobahn. We sold auto parts, wholesale and retail. And uh, thank God, after close to 60 years of being in the business, 1957, he started, we're still in business. And that's something to say, that the business lasted this long. Wow, that's terrific. In your book, you tell a story about right after you retired, your wife asked you to go to the supermarket by yourself for the first time to do the shopping. Could you give us a little summary of how that went? Uh, Please. <laughs> I'll never live. What happened was this. Uh, we lived out in Long Island. My wife was still working and I retired first. And she says, Marty, could you do me a favor and do the shopping? And I, being a nice guy, said, sure, I'd be, love to help out. Just do me a favor. Write everything out. Give me the coupons. So I'll be able to give it to the, uh, the cashier and I'll be able to do it. She says, look, before we do this, let's take a run. And I went with my wife. We went to a supermarket. She would show me, you know, where the uh, ice cream was. She would show me where the eggs were. She would show me where the cereals were. And I pretty much got an idea. I says, no problem. I'll be able to do it. 
She gave me the first list. I got into the supermarket. And believe me, it looked like a football field. I had no idea what aisles were what. I wound up getting the ice cream first. I wound up getting the chicken right after that and put it next to my ice cream. Everything seemed, this was, I couldn't read her handwriting. She wrote down TP. I thought it was toothpaste. It was supposed to be toilet paper. I have no idea what she was writing. I got everything wrong. I came to the house about two hours later. The ice cream melted all over the floor. The chicken was ice cold. She almost threw the chicken right in my face. What are you doing? I had to go back to the store and return everything and do it all over again. Uh, That was an experience. Thank God now she's retired, so she goes shopping with me, and it's a little bit easier. Now I know what TP is. I know what this is, but uh, I had no idea. And it was like a, uh, I was like a robot later on. I was able to find places, find the things where it was. I would look at the color of the box. I knew what I wanted. I didn't have to measure everything or do this. It worked out fine later on, but the beginning was a disaster. Well, you're a man after my own heart because typically when I'm sent to the store, I will come home with several things that weren't on the list and I will come home without several things that were on the list. (laughs) I know how you feel. This has just been such a wonderful conversation. I read your book. I couldn't put it down. And I did a lot of laughing. I did some crying, to be honest with you, because I was so touched by so many of your memories. And I just couldn't think of a guest who would be more appropriate for our podcast, which values telling stories and what telling stories means to future generations. At one point in history, all we had were oral history, right? It was oral right. history. That's all yes. we had. Then, you know, people started writing it down. And then there were a lot of people throughout history who couldn't write or couldn't read. So it was always passed down by father to son to daughter to granddaughter and so on. And your story is just, it just brings your neighborhood to life. I felt like I was sitting in your mother's kitchen. I felt like I was out on the streets with you playing stickball. And it did bring back a lot of memories of my childhood and stuff that we did on a lazy, hot, you know, summer afternoon. And it just warmed my heart. But I want to ask you this question. How did growing up in Brooklyn in the 1940s, the late 1940s and the 1950s impact who you are today? Brooklyn was a very unusual area, different area. You wonder why, and I always think about this, how Brooklyn turned out such great, intelligent people, celebrities like Ruth Ginsburg, Mel Brooks, Woody Allen, Red Holtzman, Henry Miller, Larry King, Joe Torrey, Mike Tyson. I could go on and on. And yet, there was another environment, criminals. Murder Incorporated with Bugsy Siegel, Dutch Schultz, Maya Lansky, they were really gangsters. They would kill on the spot. And I always wondered how could one area turn out different types of people like that? And after thinking about it, I think it has a lot to do with your, your family values, your parents, your friends you meet, the friends you made over a long time. And I think this gives you the guided path on which direction to go. And thank God... We would never lock our door. Crime was not even an issue. Life was so simple. It was just beautiful being brought up during those times. Wow. That, uh, that really says it, Marty. Thank you for that. And Marty, what, what do you want your legacy to be? I would say that my legacy should be that I added something to the next generation and generations to come. Being an author and writing this book put me in a situation where I feel I'm keeping Brooklyn alive. I'm keeping the 40s alive. I'm keeping the 50s alive, even the 60s, uh, that generations to come would always know that life was so different then. And we didn't have to depend on computers. We didn't have to depend on cell phones. If we just had a Spalding in our pocket or just Material things weren't the important thing. What was important was family values. 
was also important was being healthy. Rich had nothing to do with it at all, but to have a relationship with your parents. And I always say that, gee, the kids, I wish I would tell them now, love your parents, kiss your parents, hug your father, do whatever you could, because these days go very fast. You're only on earth a certain amount of years, and then it's all going to be gone. Make use of it. Show them you love them. And I did as a kid, and I wish my grandkids do, and they do that, to show that life is more than a computer. Life is more to know one another and to feel for one another. And that's what I wish that is in my legacy. Well said. Well said. Marty, what are you working on now? I hope you're not stopping with this book, My Brooklyn, My Way. You can't stop with that. You got to keep going. What else are you working on? I'm still on social media. I'm always thinking of new things that I remember that I forgot. I did an article the other day about a fellow by the name of Ruby. He was the Kanish man that came down Amboy Street. And a Kanish man, just to give the people that are listening that don't have any idea what a Kanish man is, is usually an old man or an old woman who would walk down with a metal cart. It usually said, Mom's Kanish is on the side. It had a salt shaker that was tied up with a chain. And it had a big stick with mustard uh, bowl right on top. And he would open up the bottom drawer that was heated with probably coal or oil. I don't know how it was heated. And you tasted the best knish in the world. No one ever could repeat the quality of that knish. There was places like Stalls knishes, and there was places all around Brooklyn. But this knish man, I don't know how he did it. He would be everywhere. He was in the Casco Mountains, people told me. I don't know how he got everywhere. He had family working for him. His wife worked for him. And he would yell out, I want to send my kids to college. Buy a knish. My wife wants to go to Florida. Buy a knish. And people would buy the knish. They would read online. He would be outside Jefferson High School, Tilden High School. He would be in public schools. He was everywhere. And he was a really legendary type of person. So I just, I didn't put that in my first book, but it's going to be in my second book. Different things come up that I, I recall now, and hopefully my next book is going to be twice as large, and there's going to be great stories in it, and it's probably going to be at least another year or two before it's uh, out. Well, I am very much looking forward to the release of that book, so I'm going to stay in touch with you to make sure I get my hands on it as soon as I'm able to. <laughs> you know, Marty, as I mentioned before, I think you really transport people back to another time. And for those people who actually lived during that time, like a lot of your friends and your brothers, it must be very heartwarming. But for those of us who maybe were, were born a little later or a lot later, it really opens our eyes to, you know, how much the human mind can create when we have to create it, when we have to create our own fun, when we have to create games. The most important ingredient, though, in the whole mix of what you talked about was friends and family. That's very important. That's very important. Many people put comments on my, uh, when I post something on uh, social media. And one of the main things that people ask me is, gee, I wish I was able to go back relive some of the memories, apologize to my mother, thank my father. And they didn't get a chance because life went so fast. And I hope those younger generation kids appreciate that. And they're able to speak to their parents and, and do whatever they could to show because these times are not going to come again. You can never go back in time. I did write a few poems. But I put my thoughts down on that. Yeah, Marty, I was just to the end of the book, I was really feeling part of your family. I just felt like I started to know all the people, all the characters that you talked about and the, almost could smell everything and hear everything that was going on because it was so descriptive. But right at the very end, you wrote a poem and it was called Going Back to Brownsville. And I got to admit, while I was reading it, it brought me to tears because it was just that sensitive and that heartfelt. I was wondering, can you share that poem with our listeners? 
I would love to do that because uh, I think your listeners will get uh, touched by what I have to say. Now that I have grown old, I hope my wish comes true. A trip back to Brownsville, Brooklyn, a neighborhood where I grew. I can't wait to visit the stores I once knew. I wonder if they remember me. I just hope they do. Yes, I'll stop by Ambush Street where I was born. I hope I am recognized since my pants are not torn. I'll take my small dean just in case we have a game. I hope being old doesn't cause me any pain. I'll check out the front window where my mom always sat. She would probably ask me to put on a sweater or a hat. I will knock at my door and ask if I could take a peek, hoping they will let me in, noticing I was old and weak. I'll wait at the front stoop until my dad returns from work. I'm sure when he sees me, he'll really have a perk. But wait, that was over 75 years ago and things may not be the same. It's possible it won't be remembered, not even my name. What if my building turned to rubble and the streets are in despair? Nothing would help me then, not even a prayer. It may be best to stay away and not go back in time. As long as I have my memories, that will be sublime. I could reminisce the experiences of being a boy. Those were the days that were truly a joy. Wow. Amen. Amen. That's great, Marty. That that really touched me, and I appreciate that. So, Marty Blumberg, My Brooklyn, My Way, From Brownsville to Canarsie in the 1950s. Wonderful book. This has been a great interview. I want to thank you so much for your time and for transporting us back many years into your cherished memories. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I hope we'll meet again. I really enjoyed doing this. It was the first time I ever did a podcast, and you were terrific, and so was Kelly, your wife. So thank you very much. Well, we're very honored. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Hey, look, sometime in the future, when this COVID stuff blows by, we'd love to meet you someday. Uh, it'll be my pleasure. I'll bring a small ding with me. Could you please? <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll throw my dinner into the pool. <laughs> Take care. Uh, okay, Marty. Thank Bye-bye. You. Bye-bye now. So, for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. Please subscribe, share, and check out our website at yourhistoryyourstory.com for episode notes and bonus content. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.